So one of my all-time favorite action movies was this movie that was released back in 2007. And it was one that maybe some of you have seen, maybe some of you not, and that's okay. Uh, the name of this movie was called Vantage Point, and it followed the plot of, of all these different witnesses with different points of view trying to unravel an assassination attempt on the U.S. president. Now, moments after the president's arrival to uh, this courtyard, shots ring out. And in the resulting chaos of the shots, American, this American tourist comes forward uh, with his camcorder, which he believes contains an image of said shooter. And then the whole movie goes throughout this, uh, this same scene of the courtyard, of all the chaos, over and over again, seven different times from seven different vantage points of some of the people in attendance to try and find out who the shooter exactly was. Now, it's a great concept for a movie. It's obviously one of my favorite ones, but it's an even beth better method to read and study scripture. So just like the movie that looks at multiple different characters' points of views, this morning we will be doing the exact same thing with two different characters from scripture, Moses and God. And so from the lenses of Moses and God, we will look at three different stories from Moses' life and how his vantage point towards himself and God changes over time, but how God's remains the same. Now this morning, we are going to start by reading uh, at, the, at the beginning of Moses' story and his reluctance to answer God's call. So if you have your Bible this morning, I encourage you to open up to Exodus chapter Three. Exodus chapter 3 is where we'll see uh, the beginning of Moses' story. Um, well, I guess it's kind of the middle of Moses' story, but it's the beginning of where we're going to start today. And as I highlighted earlier, we are going to use this vantage point method to see different perspectives of God and Moses in our text. So Exodus chapter 3 opens with kind of a small recap of what ended uh, chapter 2. And so Moses is now married. He, he found work as a shepherd for his father-in-law Jethro. And, and it's been a very, very long time since Moses left Egypt. Almost 40 years since uh, Moses has left Egypt. But God has continued to look after him and look after Israel while they're still held in captivity in Egypt. Now, it's time for God to finally call out Moses from the wilderness. And so Moses is tending his flock one day. And just like he had done before for the last 40 years, uh, but he sees something a little bit strange. He sees a, a bush that is burning with fire, but not actually burning. And so thinking it was kind of odd, thinking it was peculiar, he goes out to check what was going on. And it is here where God begins to call Moses out and begins to call Moses for his purpose. And that's where we see Moses' vantage point of being called out, giving God five different excuses as to why it shouldn't be him who leads the Israelites out. So Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 11, we will see Moses' first excuse. Excuse number one, verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So Moses tells God, Look, who am I really? I, I'm not your person. Moses here says, God, are you really like for real right now? Like you, you, you really think that I'm the best option for this big mission to save all of Israel? Who really am I to be the one to do this? I am just a lowly shepherd. And even more than that, uh, Moses is around the age of, of 80. He's been living, uh, he lived in Egypt for about 40 years. Now he's living in the wilderness for about 40 years. And now he's about 80. Um, and he, 40 years ago, he killed an, Isra uh, an Egyptian who was hurting an Israelite. And so he killed an Egyptian, he hid him in the sand, and then he ran away running from his sin. And so God uh, calls him out, and Moses said, no, I'm not the person you want because I've done all these bad things. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I can't go back to Egypt. Who am I to lead them out of Egypt? But God responds with a response, and then Moses gives another excuse, excuses number two and three, starting in verse 13. Moses says back to God, suppose I go back to Is the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell him? And this leads to excuse number three. Jump down to chapter four, verse one. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Moses pretty much says, what if they don't believe me? What am I going to say? Now, to be fair to Moses at this point, these two excuses were probably the most reasonable out of all five uh, because there weren't really any direct revelations from God to Israelites in a long time. Now, if that doesn't really ring a bell for you, let me rephrase that. There has not been a revelation by God to any Israelite in 430 years. 
That's generation after generation after generation. God is silent. God hasn't spoken to an Israelite since Joseph 430 years ago. So the fact that Moses says they're not going to believe me is a valid point. But at the same time, it's, it's God who's standing right in front of you, and he's telling you this is what you're supposed to do. And so even after God dismisses that excuse, Moses doubled down again in chapter 4 when he says that excuse one more time. What if they don't believe me? Especially that it's a direct revelation from God. And then Moses because he's still not giving up. Excuse number four, chapter four, verse 10. He says this, Moses says to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been elegant, uh, neither in past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And so Moses leads into his inability to speak to a crowd. And Moses tries to get out of his calling by God by using one of the most popular fears of all time, which is public speaking. Public speaking has historically been the one fear that people most despise. It ranks over the fear of heights. It ranks over the fear of falling. It even ranks over the fear of dying. People hate public speaking. Even those that do it for a living, sometimes those people still don't like public speaking. And here Moses says the same thing. He's just a little afraid of public speaking. So yeah, that's, that's a reason why God uh, can't use me because I'm afraid to public speak. And so God responds to that. And then Moses, one more time, excuse number five, ex, uh, Exodus 4, starting in verse 13. Moses says, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. At this point, he's like, dude, I just don't want to go, God. Please just send anyone else. He's probably been singing that this whole time, but came up with four other excuses before he got to this. This was his last and final push by Moses to get out of his ordained calling. And most, Moses just simply does not want to do this. Now, I'm not sure what his mental state was before this kind of revelation by God, but I'd imagine he's, he's quite happy being a shepherd. Uh, he's got a wife. He's got a kids. He's got a family. He's, he might just be happy where he's at at the moment. So why would he want to mess that up? But this last reason was probably the one he wanted to start with, right? This was the underlining secret to the mission of Moses' heart. He just did not want to undertake this divine mission, this big mission by God that was placed on him. Anyone else in the world could have done it except me because I just don't want to do it. Please, God, just send someone else. I am good exactly where I'm at. Moses just, just didn't have faith in what God could do through him, just a lowly shepherd, just someone uh, who, who escaped Egypt, right? Colossians 1, Paul tells us, Be, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has already qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people of the kingdom of light. And so what Moses didn't understand is that whatever God has called you to do, no matter how small or how big, like Moses, Paul tells us that he has already qualified you to do such thing. God already knows what you're meant to do. You just have to have faith in him and understand that God knows best. And God will respond to each of Moses' excuses in attempts to get him, Moses, to rely on God's strength instead of his own. So response number one, God tells Moses, or Moses tells God, who am I? And God responds with what? I will be with you. Who am I that I can go out and, and lead the Israelites out of Egypt? God says, I will be with you every step of the way. You don't need anyone else. I have you. And then Moses again says, what if they don't believe me, God? Uh, res uh, excuse number two. What if they people don't believe me? God responds, I am who I am. This is one of the most famous passages, what Jesus uses in his I am statements. God says, I am who I am. If they need to know who I am, just tell them. I am. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. My name lives on forever. My name is above every other name. They are going to know who I am. And so Moses says, no, no, wait, but like what if they really don't believe me? And so then God, in response to this, gives Moses three different signs. He gives uh, one sign to say, hey, if they don't believe you, give them this sign. If they don't believe you again, give them this sign. And if they really don't believe you a third time, here's another sign for you. And Moses says, well, I'm just afraid of public speaking. All those are great. You might be with me. You might be the I am. But, like, I, I don't like public speaking. And in response to this, God says, I will give you every word to say. But Moses just doesn't want to do it. His excuse number five, here's the thing, God, I really just don't want to do it. I know you can give me the words to say. I know that you are I am. I know that you'll be with me. But at the end of the day, I just don't want to do it. 
Please just find someone else. And so God, in response to this, says, look, I will send your brother Moses. He will accompany you on this great mission. I will give you the words to say, I am the I am, and I will be with you every step of the way. And so at this point, Moses can't refuse any, uh, any more of this calling, right? Moses has refused it up to this point. Now he has to accept it. And even though Moses knew of God, he knew what God has done in the past, he just didn't have enough faith that God could do the same for him at this time. But through time, through uh, living for God and with God, Moses will start to see everything that God can do. And Moses will realize as his faith starts to grow that God is with him every step of the way. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We just heard from Sam of a time when Moses had, honestly, very little faith in God. Don't get me wrong. He knew exactly who God was and what he could do. I mean, he just presented himself in a burning bush. Moses didn't, he didn't have faith that God could or should use him. Kind of seems like, he, he, uh, it kind of seems like he didn't have faith that God's ways were better than his own. And really, can you blame him? He had a pretty decent life, and going back to the same place where he murdered a man, Try to get God's people out who weren't his biggest fans already, getting them out kind of seems like a lot of work. But after a while, he begrudgingly let God use him. He started to grow in his faith. And when he started to have the assurance of things hoped for, for when he started to see things in the perspective of the unseen as opposed to the seen, we see this after the Israelites made it out of Egypt when they started to complain in Exodus 16, 1 through 3. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the fifteenth day, on the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and when the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. At this point, if I were Moses, I would be furious. People are complaining against him who didn't even want to get him out of Egypt. And that just kind of shows how Moses has changed perspective in his faith. He went from telling God that he was wrong in choosing him to being able to take criticism that was not fairly thrown on him. We see in the next verses that it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out uh, out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard you grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumbled against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. What are we? Do you notice how he says it twice? He's putting emphasis on it. Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Moses is basically saying, why are you complaining against me? Why are you complaining against my brother Aaron? I have no power that you could be complaining against except for the power that God gave to me. Moses realizes that it was God who has the power. Moses has complete faith that God is in control Otherwise, he could have easily said something much more in line with, you guys are right. I don't know why we came out here. I was wrong. I was just seeing things. Let's all go back to Egypt because I don't want to starve out here. Or he could say to God, why have you failed me? But instead, he humbles himself and says to the people, you can't be complaining against me because I have no power that you could be complaining against. 
You see, Moses beforehand, prior, he had faith in quotation marks. He didn't really believe. He, he believed in God and in the power of God, but it wasn't enough to get him to believe God. The difference between believing and really, truly believing is more than just emphasis. Belief on the surface would be taken as just kind of thinking something is true. But if you translate it to the language of that time, it really means something more along the lines of having a deep commitment to something and, and like having confidence in it. Another way to put it would be Moses believed in God, but he just really didn't believe God. It's easy to believe to something when it doesn't really affect us. But we can see in the example of Moses that when you were with the Lord, you don't just believe in God. You believe God. Let me tell you a little story of a time not that long ago when I was on vacation. So I went to this theme park, and I mean, honestly, it was an experience. They had mini golf. They had all these little ponds. They had roller coasters. And in those ponds, they had the little fish that you could feed and all that. It was so much fun. Uh, there were water rides, and honestly, the biggest game of all, they had an arcade. Don't even get me started about the claw machine. But there's this particular ride that always had a super long line. It had the name, the Sky Coaster. It was this giant swing that you would strap yourself in, and what seemed you would fall at the speed of sound. And if you told me it was any shorter than 500 feet, I'd call you a liar, but I looked it up, it's only 110 feet. Actually, we have a picture of one, yeah. Yeah, it's right there. You see that little dark rectangle right there? Yeah, that's a person. That, they're only halfway up. So here I am. I'm at this theme park. Uh, I'm at this theme park, and I see this coaster, and you know what? You know me. I want to go to the ride that send, it feels like it's going to send you straight to Kansas. So I get in line, and I watch all these people get harnessed, and I'm not really worried about anything. I'm just having a good time watching people fall 110 feet. I completely believe in this harness. But once I got strapped in, things changed. <laughs> it went from believing that this harness isn't going to snap to having to believe that this harness, it'll hold my life, my future. In a sense, this is my salvation. And I start, as I started to get pulled up, the sound of the laughter and the warmth of the sun got replaced by this cold air that felt like it was going to throw me straight out of this cocoon, which just gets more and more claustrophobic as I get higher. And once I reached the top, I realized there's no backing out. My life is here. Man, when I was on the ground... I believed in this harness. It was easy. How many other people before me went on the same exact harness? But now, now it's different. There's the thought in the back of my mind, what if it fails? Now it's a lot harder to believe this harness. I had to pull the cord to start the swing. What a daunting moment. Knowing that when you pull that cord, your life is in this harness. Nothing else can save me. When I pulled the cord, I had to believe the straps, the carabiners, the ropes. I had to have faith that it would carry me. I no longer just believed in the harness. I believed the harness. We saw earlier how Moses believed in God. But Exodus 17, 1 through 4 shows how Moses believed God. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved from the, wizard, uh, from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people there thirsted for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt, to kill our children and our livestock and us with thirst? 
So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do? What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Once again, if I were Moses, I would be furious. But once again, Moses humbles himself, he has faith in the Lord, and he says, why do you quarrel with me? Do you, why do you test the Lord? Remember that this is the same man that in Exodus 3, 11 through 14, where it says, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He, being God, said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. In verse 11, Moses says, who am I? In verse 14, God says, I am who I am. In the middle of those two verses, there's verse 13, which says, verse 11, where Moses says, who am I, doesn't matter because there's verse 14, because God says, I am who I am. Who is Moses that he should go to Pharaoh? Absolutely nothing. But the great I am will be with him. This was Moses, the man that gave God at least five excuses as to why he shouldn't be the one to do the Lord's work. The one whose God's anger was kindled against and the one that God was about to kill in Exodus 4.24. That same Moses, he asks the people of Israel, why do you test the Lord? It seems a bit ironic, but the truth is Moses isn't the same. Moses has been with the Lord. Rather, the Lord has been with Moses. In James, it says, when you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. Before God was with Moses, he was nothing but a murderer. And the worst part about it is it kind of seems like he was okay with it. He didn't try to pursue God. And when God presented himself to him, he more or less said, I don't want to. He was just happy knowing who God was and what he could do. But when it came to affecting his life, it doesn't seem like that's really what he wanted. But when he got committed to the Lord, he started to grow in his faith. This is the perfect example of when you're truly with the Lord, you will have fruit. The fruit that we're looking at right now is faith. Moses no longer says, God, I don't want to. He now asks the Lord, what do I do? Exodus 17, 5 through 7 says, The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of all the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you at the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it. The water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massah and Meribah. Because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? You see, Moses didn't question the Lord. He did exactly what the Lord commanded, having full faith that what the Lord said would come true. Church. I'm going to ask a question that I think we really should think about. Don't answer. We should just think about it. Does our faith go more in line with Moses' in chapter 3? Where he just gave a bunch of excuses as to why he shouldn't be the one to do the Lord's work? Or is it closer to chapter 16 and 17 when God said something, he did it. He believed God. Do we have faith in God? I can guess that by the fact that we're all here, that most of us believe in God. But Moses, seeing the burning bush, didn't get him to heaven. Going to church and singing songs 
doesn't get you into heaven, although those are, that is a wonderful thing to do, and it's commanded by the Lord, that doesn't save us. Moses was not saved by knowing that there was a God or by being a good person. Moses was saved when he let his faith in God lead him and when he believed God. It's easy for me to think that Moses kind of had it easy. He had a burning bush, a burning bush with an angel of the Lord speaking to him through it. He knew exactly what the Lord wanted him to do. I don't have a burning bush. In John 20, 29, it says, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have still believed. Though we haven't seen miraculous signs like a burning bush or plagues or Dagon falling or having lion's mouths shut in front of us, though we haven't seen any of those, that doesn't mean we have any excuse not to believe. In Romans 1.20, it says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Another thing to remember is our faith needs to be nurtured. It's either growing or it's fading. As you've probably heard, faith is a lifelong journey. It's not a destination. There's no point that you'll have it completed. When we don't continue to put effort into our faith, it can so easily start to fade without us even noticing it. We see this all too often in the church when somebody, whether they be a new Christian or a veteran in the faith, they're in fire for the Lord. They believe God. But they start to get a bit busy and waking up early in the mornings to try to spend time in scriptures and praying, it, it's a little bit of a challenge. And, you know, they got a new promotion at their job and they're working really hard and the only free time is on Sundays. And they really want to see their son's football games, which also lands on a Sunday. So how bad would it really be to miss it? A few years down the line, and this person hasn't even been inside of a church building in over a year. Their relationships with their spouse and kids, they're failing, they're depressed, and the only way out is to just try to numb themselves. This person, who was once on fire for the Lord, was serving in every way that they could. They didn't nurture their faith. They didn't have their faith guarded. In 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, it says, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Church, we need to nurture our faith. It will only grow or it will fade. We talked about how Moses' faith grew, but there was another time in Moses, when Moses didn't nurture his faith. And it started to grow in a way that was kind of unsuitable. Listen to what happens next. So just when we thought that Moses was on the right track, finally believing God, for him it started out a little rocky, not fully believing in God, but slowly, as Jacoby highlighted, he starts to grow his faith of God, so that no matter what was happening around him, no matter what the Israelites were grumbling about, no matter what was going on in his life, he was going to stay strong in faith, so we think. But as we keep reading throughout the Old Testament, even heroes of the faith get mixed up in pleasing men instead of pleasing God. And so if you still have your Bibles open, turn over to the book of
way, and this is significant and relevant to what we're about to unfold because Moses, the, uh, be, about Moses because the author here is cluing us in for what's to come in just a minute. So Numbers 20, starting in verse 2, it says this. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If we had only died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord, why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die? Why, uh, it, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates. And they're very specific things that they're asking for even when they're so hungry and thirsty. And there is no water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Now, stay on track with these instructions. They're going to sound very, very similar. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff. And you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before, the, before their eyes, and it will pour out of its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that your livestock and them can drink. Now we're going to stop there. Now at this point in the story, everything looks eerily similar to what was just been read in Exodus chapter 17, right? The people start to grumble. They're thirsty. They're hungry. They don't feel like they have enough food and water for them. And because they're hungry and thirsty, they start making these outlandish claims, right? Now we need pomegranates. We need grapevines. We need all these different things. And so they start grumbling against Moses and Aaron. And so we see Moses and Aaron go to the entrance of the tent of meeting, drop to the ground, and without saying anything, the Lord knows their intentions. The Lord tells them and appears to them exactly what to do. Now, you remember those instructions. I've kind of uh, written some of them down up on the board. Uh, the first instruction, take your staff, okay? That is their instruction. Eerily similar to what was said in Exodus chapter 17, right? Now, take your staff. Now, gather the assembly, right? Gather assembly. They want Moses and Aaron to gather the assembly, and then what's different here in Numbers 20, God tells them to do what instead? Speak to the rock, okay? Instead of striking the rock, speak to the rock, okay? Those are Moses' instructions. Now, we will see if Moses actually follows his instructions, continues to grow in his faith, and continue to express that faith in God. Picking back up in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 9, keep track of those instructions. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses, stop there. We're going to see what he does, because there's a cliffhanger. We're going to have to just wait to find out what Moses does, because Moses follows step one, right? He ste step one is take the staff. Easy enough. He's been carrying that thing around for dozens of years. He has that stick on hand. He can follow that step easily. Step two Moses and Aaron gather the assembly, right? Everyone gathers together a little bit harder because they have to gather so many people, but easily accomplished, right? Everything was going to according to plan. Everything that God had commanded Moses was doing, except Moses will now declare that it is through his power and not God's that the people will have water, okay? Cliffhanger picked back up in Numbers 20, verse 10. Moses said to them, uh, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give you. There, these were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. Now, Remember the rules? Take the staff, gather the assembly, speak to the rock. What did Moses do instead? Instead, he made a speech to the Israelites about how they're terrible, about how they stunk, about how they kept grumbling against the Lord. He told them that they were being rebels. And instead of speaking to the rock, he spoke to the Israelites. And instead of speaking to the rock, he then struck the rock. How many times? twice. Moses' direct disobedience to God here strikes a chord in what's about to happen later in his life. God never told Moses to lecture his people. 
especially in anger. There have been times where this was necessitated, that God said, hey, speak to the Israelites for me. But even after getting the first two right, Moses' anger steers him to rely more on himself and lose that faith in God. Moses disobeys God directly, striking the rock twice instead of speaking to it. Out of anger and frustration against the people of Israel, Moses lashes out against the rock not once, but twice. Moses' sinful attitude and actions were rooted in his unbelief. He didn't really believe God in this moment when the Lord told him to speak to the rock and not strike it. Moses believed that God could take water out of a rock if you hit it, but he didn't believe that God can take water out of the rock if you spoke to it. Instead, he believed in what he was already been done, which was striking the rock. And because he had to use his own power, he had to do it twice. Now, unbelief has many different forms. It was easy to see Israelites' unbelief in Numbers 14 and 17 when they refused to trust God and enter Canaan. Here, Moses was also unbelieving, but in very different circumstances. Moses did not trust God to correct his people. And so Moses took it upon himself to do just that. And at the same time, God did not want to correct Israel at all. There were a lot of things that Moses had done wrong in this passage. Among those are taking credit for himself instead of God. Thinking God's work must include something more than just a single word. That presenting God is angry when he's not. That failure to draw on God's strength and the most important is just simple disobedience. But even despite this failure of Moses in the attitude and action, God still provides. The text says that water gushed out of the rock. God's love for his people is so great that he can use imperfect instruments to fulfill his perfect plan. You see, the mere fact that God uses someone is not evidence that they are a person that are in right relationship with him. Because God can use imperfect instruments to fulfill his perfect plan. And so what does that mean for us? Colossians 1 again says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people of the kingdom of light. God knew, God knew Moses. Moses knew of God. And when God called him out, God had to remind Moses of his true calling, even if Moses didn't want it, even if Moses didn't like it. And when they were in the wilderness, Moses continued to rely, trust, and have faith that God would be there to provide. And he did, time and time again. But Moses also slipped out of faith and began to rely on himself again. But God was still revered. And at the end of it all, God was seen as holy among the people of Israel. Moses had long been seen as one of the great men of faith. And that can oftentimes be discouraging to see that a great man of faith like Moses fell out of faith in stories like this. But at the same time for us, it can be encouraging to see that someone just like Moses, someone great in the faith, can also get lost and take credit for themselves instead of giving God the credit that he deserves. So what these three stories tell us about Moses is that we need to have faith that God has called you because you are already qualified. That when God calls you, he already knows what is best for you. That when God calls you, he already sees a future that's laid out for you. That when God calls you, he already has your future in his hands. What we can also take away from these three is that have faith every step of the road. It's not enough just to have faith in God. It's not enough just to have faith of God. It's, it's, we have to have faith every single step of the road. Because with Moses' life, he had faith uh, when God started to do good things. But once those good things start, stopped coming, he started to rely on himself again. And God wants us to have ev faith every step of the road, no matter what comes. But know this, even in our lack of faith, God will always and ultimately still be praised. Again, in Numbers chapter 20, it says, but the Lord said to Moses, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of Israelites, you will not bring this community into land I give you. These were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. Even in our lack of faith, God will still be praised because God can use imperfect instruments to fulfill his perfect plan. So you're looking at the different vantage points of Moses and God. Moses was up and down, lack of faith, a lot of faith, lack of faith, a lot of faith. 
but God remained the same. And church, we have to understand that no matter what we go through in life, no matter how much faith or little faith that we have in certain moments, God will always be the same. And in our, our abundance of faith and in our lack of faith, God will remain the same and God will be praised. Because God can use imperfect instruments to fulfill his perfect plan. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can come together as a group of believers and just learn and praise you. God, I pray that those who are in the audience today that are feeling like they're, they're in line with Moses, that, that they're doing things for themselves, that they're doing things uh, because they feel like they have the power. And I, I pray that you just speak through them and let them know that you hold all power. That even in their lack of faith, that you will still be praised. And God, I pray for those that feel like they have abundance of faith and they, they might feel like a lack of faith is coming. God, I want you to speak to them and, and let them know that no matter what happens, you will remain the same. And God, we thank you that, we can use, that you can use imperfect people like us to fulfill your perfect plan. God, we don't know our futures, but you do. God, we don't know what's next, but you do. God, we don't, know how, we don't have all the answers sometimes, but you do. And let, help us rely on you and have faith in you alone. God, we thank you for everything that you've given us, everything that you continue to give us. And we ask this in your holy and precious name. To not compendigate, to a santa, son of one. Amen.